He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Welcome back, folks, to Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. Dr. Philip Ovedia, I'm Jack Heald. And we are joined today by somebody who has a really interesting set of websites that I've been stalking him on. I've got a bunch of questions, Phil, but why don't you introduce our guest and we'll see where it goes. But then I'm going to hit him with the hard stuff. Definitely sounds good. Again, just excited every week for the conversations we're having. This week, we have Dominic D'Agostino joining us. Dom has really been at the forefront of the research around nutrition, metabolic health. He's got an amazing background in both nutrition and neurosciences, a real leader, I would say, in the research in this field and excited to have this conversation with him. One other thing that we'll touch on is the amazing conferences that Dominic has been leading with his team the past few years, the Metabolic Health Summit. And we're going to talk about the upcoming version of that as well. So, but before we get into that, Dom, why don't you give a little bit more of your background and maybe a little bit about how you got so interested in nutrition and the research into that. Yeah. Well, with nutrition, I guess it goes all the way back to high school when I was more or less like training for football and trying to gain weight. And I was a real skinny kid. So nutrition was the way to get there, drinking like protein shakes and things like that. So I remember picking up like at the time muscle and fitness. I don't even know if it's still sold anymore, but what really attracted me to it and what I thought thought was the missing link because I was training very hard was the nutritional component of that. So I would always read all the nutrition articles in high school got interested and I majored in it in undergrad. And as I went through undergrad, I wanted to go to med school. So I double majored in bio, but then I didn't really see like a future in nutrition as a career, just because it was pretty limited in dietetics, but I did go through a dietetics program. I didn't do, I did nutritional science dietetics courses, but I ended up doing my PhD in uh, neuroscience and physiology, like the integration of the two. So it was a neural control of autonomic regulation. So the brainstem mechanisms that control, for example, the respiratory neurons in the brainstem, and then the neural control of cardiovascular regulation. So the sympathetic drive, like the C1 region of the uh, brainstem and how those two areas interconnected with each other, how respiratory neurons were kind of synced up with cardiovascular neurons. So I studied breathing, really, the neural control of breathing, and that got me very much interested in diving physiology. So I did a postdoctoral fellowship by the Navy looking at oxygen toxicity seizures and really went down the rabbit hole of drugs and antioxidant compounds to mitigate as a countermeasure of oxygen toxicity seizures. To make a long story short, like nothing really worked, but I discovered the ketogenic diet was used for drug refractory seizures. And that's what I was like. Okay. Really studying. You, used, you used two different adjectives to describe seizure, seizures, drug yeah. refractory and oxygen toxicity. Yes. So central nervous system oxygen toxicity is a limitation for Navy SEAL diving. And then central nervous system oxygen toxicity also limits the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy that has 14 different FDA approved applications. For example, carbon monoxide poisoning, diabetic wounds, decompression sickness, right? Our limit to using hyperbaric oxygen therapy is that oxygen is a neural stimulant and it will cause a seizure. So if someone has like decompression sickness or let's take carbon monoxide poisoning, you have to get that carbon monoxide off the hemoglobin molecule. And the way to do that is to hyper oxygenate them to saturate their tissues with high levels of oxygen. But we just can't give 50, 50 atmospheres of oxygen, right? That would cause a massive seizure and the person would die. So the limitation is really about three atmospheres of oxygen. So we don't know fundamentally why, this is what I study, why oxygen toxicity seizures occur, but they limit Navy SEAL divers using a closed circuit rebreather. And they also limit the potential ceiling for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So I spent my postdoctoral fellowship career 
looking fundamentally at what causes oxygen toxicity. So okay. we develop a wide range of tools that are inside hyperbaric chambers. Everything from patch clamp electrophysiology to confocal microscopes. I built an atomic force microscope inside a hyperbaric chamber. It was like my postdoctoral project. And in the process of doing all this, I went back to like nutrition because I realized that if you feed the cells different diets, <laughs> so different molecules like in a cell culture and then animal models, that you could preserve neuronal activity even in the context of a very high levels of oxidative stress and a dysregulation of the neurotransmitter systems, which occur with oxygen toxicity. So I was feeding lactate, I was feeding different types of glucose molecules and actually started studying ketones. And in the context of fueling neurons on ketones, I noticed that the reactive oxygen species didn't go up. And I noticed I measure like the membrane potential of the cells. That's like cells are like little batteries and they fire action potentials. And a cell was able to maintain its electrical membrane potential and calcium signaling in the context of being energized off ketone bodies. So this was very interesting to me. So we moved to an animal model where we basically developed synthetic ketones and we would feed the animals synthetic ketones and push them to very high levels of oxygen. And we could go like 600 times longer at a given level of oxygen if the animal was in a state of therapeutic ketosis. Now that level of ketosis would be equivalent to you or I fasting for an entire week. So it was like five millimolar to six millimolar. Glucose was very low, about 2.5 to three millimolar. So the ketones were two millimolar concentration were two times higher than the level of glucose. So that's a very hard state to achieve physiologically, but not with like synthetic ketone molecules that we develop and test. So that was like well over a decade ago. And that was a springboard for my career to really study the ketogenic diet. And then also ketone supplements, electrolyte ketones, like beta hydroxybutyrate combined with sodium, potassium, magnesium. So we call these ketone salts, MCT oil, ketone esters. Like we look at all these different molecules and then we formulate them. And then we apply them to different pathological scenarios, right? Oxygen toxicity, cancer, Angelman syndrome, inborn errors in metabolism and things like that. So I have a student looking at the effects of ketones on epigenetic regulation, specifically the metabolic control of gene expression. So different metabolites that change in response to the diet can actually influence various enzymes called histone deacetylase enzymes. And the metabolites can directly interact with the histones to increase or decrease gene expression. So this is like kind of where my lab is at now. I mean, a big part of what we do now, we do metabolic physiology, but we're looking at the ketogenic control of gene expression. So it's kind of like the next frontier kind of thing. I'm not, I think it's super important, but I, I think it's like, it's very exploratory research. So we'll see where it goes, but yeah, glad to talk about any of the different things that we're working on. So and monitoring too. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to uh, kind of sum that up a little bit. And uh, it goes without saying that this is, this is high level stuff. So for the audience out there, don't feel bad if you have to go back, rewind, listen to that a few times, because <laughs> this is some major science. But what you're describing, essentially, my sort of takeaway from it would be that you've been able to demonstrate, at least in animal models, that the ketogenic state better allows the body and specifically the brain to tolerate what would typically be a, a toxic situation and resist the damage that would normally come from toxicity, such as very high oxygen levels. Is that kind of a decent summary of it? Yeah, I steered it towards neuroscience, but the seminal research was actually done in heart in a working for fused heart preparation by Dr. Richard Veach, who trained on, under Dr. Uh, Hans Krebs, the Krebs cycle. So uh, Dr. Veach passed away about three or four years ago. But he did work in the uh, working heart preparation and showed that the metabolic efficiency of the heart was significantly increased uh, when it used ketones as energy and the hydraulic efficiency of the heart increased. 
So he had a, a lab at the NIH and was NIH funded uh, to develop synthetic ketones as a cardioprotective metabolic fuel, but later actually was funded by DARPA to develop ketones in a program that DARPA had called Warfighter Dominance. And that caught my attention because it was like, not so much in the public domain, but I think I had like sort of backdoor access to what some of this stuff was being funded at the DOD and DARPA. And I saw some patents and I saw uh, some grants that were very big, like in the $15 million range on warfighter dominance. So I was like, wow, this is a great opportunity. I could develop an anti-seizure strategy that also has the potential to enhance the warfighter's performance. So I got very excited about it. And, and I remember just those early days of talking with Dr. Veach, uh, Dr. George Cahill, who was like the sort of like the king of like fasting physiology, Dr. Theodore Van Italy, Dr. Sammy Hashem, all these people were like icons in the field of metabolism. And they kind of wrote the book on ketogenesis and fasting metabolism, but they were the early pioneers. And I came in much later. People were like, I spearheaded this, but no work was being done for decades. Uh, before I stepped into this area of science. And, and you've been involved in some research, I know, working with our military to see if we can help soldiers to optimize their performance with the use of ketogenic diets, correct? Yeah, yeah. So it started as basic science research. And then our lab doesn't do a whole lot of clinical. Uh, I'm on a PI on various clinical projects. Uh, but our lab is more of like a basic science research, like cells, animal model systems. But we vet out various formulations, and then we're actually doing research at Duke University. They have a very big human hyperbaric facility there where we're basically doing reproducing the rat studies in humans. And in addition to like clinical trials that we do, I get involved personally in research where I am the subject myself, not only in like N of one experiments, but we've worked with, for example, NASA on the NASA's extreme environment mission operations, where we live underwater for, I was 10 days. My wife was under for nine days. So that's NEMO, N-E-E-M-O, and it's NASA's space analog mission. So it gives us an opportunity to test things in that really extreme environment, whether it be Everything from microbiome to cognitive function testing to metabolic parameters and things like that. So we get a really good understanding of how extreme environments affect our bodies. And it's super important to understand what's changing because you need to understand what's being altered to develop a countermeasure or mitigation strategy. Because I learned early on that if you don't fundamentally know what's happening at the level of the cell, then you can't develop a mitigation strategy to prevent it from happening. So I started throwing all sorts of things and drugs and antioxidant cocktails that just kind of weren't working. So the cell-based studies actually let us know fundamentally kind of what was happening. And then that really was a springboard for developing very effective countermeasures in these extreme environments. What was the underwater exp experiment? What was the e extreme environment? What was happening there environmentally other than obviously being underwater? What were you simulating? Yeah, a good question. I would assume lower gravity, but... Yeah, it, no, it's a great question. So when NASA sends astronauts to space, they train them in the water. So one facility is the neutral buoyancy lab, and that's at NASA. And we did some of our training in there. But to train them operationally on various procedures and equipment and things that they're going to take to space, they use what's called a space simulation analog. So there's a number of them. There's a HERA mission. There's a high seas mission in Hawaii. It's on the top of a big volcano. But the only space analog that actually uses astronauts instead of uh, surrogates is the NASA's extreme environment mission operations. So That's my commander, NEMO. Okay. NEMO, and that, and it's spelled N-E-E-M-O. So I was on NEMO, I was a crew member on NEMO 22. My wife was on an all-female crew, NEMO 23. And this specific mission sends astronauts down and also occasionally they get on scientists. And I was one of the scientists that was able to get on. And you train before, and the, the basis is that you'll do, like, it's a very... Similar simulation to being on the International Space Station. You lived in a confined environment. You wake up, you use the same protocols, you're testing equipment, 
and procedures, but you're living in a dry habitat, but the habitat is underwater in the Atlantic and the habitat is dry, but it's pressurized to like three atmospheres. And then during the day, you go out of the atmosphere, you go out of the dry habitat and you're in the water and you're tethered to like an umbilical cord and you work outside. That's called an EVA or extravehicular activity. Right. When you're on the space station and have to go outside the space station, they do an EVA. So they're out in space, right? So we do simulated EVAs. That would be a simulation of like working on the surface. Like we put weights on ourselves to simulate the lunar surface or weights to simulate Mars. And then we have various like drills and equipment and procedures and we go collect samples we did in this case we did coral samples and you like you look at the dna of the coral and then you do different experiments like that simulate like kind of what you do on mars but it's like obviously a shorter mission it's not like you're there for a year but it's a very i mean dozens of people at nasa are involved and there's different companies involved and florida university is involved and they maintain the habitat and we had five IRB approved protocols and collected a massive amount of data. Only a fraction of it has been published so far. We're still like analyzing the data from this collection, but you're living and training with astronauts. So it's pretty cool. And it's a very well-run mission. So why is your living environment pressurized to three atmospheres? Is that just for, so it doesn't collapse or is there more to it than that? Yeah, that's part of it, I guess. So the atmosphere, it's called the Aquarius habitat. So it's kind of like if you're like in a pool and you take a cup and you push it down to the bottom of the pool, that air will compress if you go down right. 10 okay. meters to half of it. So the habitat is like a pressurized environment that you can swim down and get up into. There's no door. There's no hatch. Oh, okay. So All right. Submarines, that makes sense. Yeah. Submarines, one atmosphere, right? So you have to like seal it off, but you can swim down. And then there's air that comes into it. So you can, so you're living under pressure. So the idea is that it's an extreme habitat. It has similar CO2 levels, similar oxidative stress that you'll experience like in space. But the main thing is that if something goes wrong, you just can't go up to the surface, right? right. So you're living in a, what's called a saturation environment. So it takes you about 17 hours to decompress, to get to the top. So in that case, it's very dangerous and it's extreme. If something goes wrong, if you have a heart attack, if you have an infection or, or something down there, you have to go up and they have to put you in a chamber. And it's like a very, it's my commander, Shell Lindgren, before we decompressed and went up to the top, I said it took five hours to get from ISS down to earth. And it's going to take us 17 hours to get back to earth <laughs> from Nemo because you have to do the stage decompression. So in that way, you're isolated it's extreme environment. It has certain effects on the body and it's a very good simulation. You follow a certain, you wake up and you do like exactly what they would do on ISS okay. or various missions. So you have a lot of work to do. So you're like a scientist and you have to do a lot of work inside the habitat and outside the habitat. And it gives okay. us an opportunity to, yeah, like I was measuring my ketones. I was doing metabolomics. I was measuring neurotransmitters. Metabolomics? Yeah, like, yeah, so just you take a sample of blood and you look at cardiometabolic uh, effects, that's one thing, but you can also, for me personally, I was in a state of ketosis, so I would measure the different metabolite changes that would occur in extreme environments. Some of the things that jumped out were my HSCRP levels, my inflammation markers, which I've measured for over a decade, were always like 0.2 to like not even measurable. So, but on, in this extreme habitat, the partial pressure of CO2 is something about 4,000 to 8,000 parts per million, which is about like 20 times higher than we're breathing in space. And CO2 alters many different changes in our body, redox changes, and also the, the tight junctions in our gut. So it probably impacts like gut permeability and things like that. So my inflammation levels went way up. We do reactive time, cognitive function tests. So it's like an extreme environment. And we're very interested in developing a dietary and a supplement protocol that would cause what we call performance resilience. So you take measurements before you go down. And then when you go down, you do cognitive tests, you do physical tests, you do all these different tests. And there's usually a decrement. So the idea is to 
create, it could be a variety of different things, a supplement, an exercise protocol, things like that. You want to basically develop a protocol that it allows you to maintain performance resilience in that extreme environment. And NASA does a lot of that on ISS with exercise, but they're looking at drugs or looking at all sorts of things, but we're very interested in the dietary component of it sure. and also the supplement component. All right. So translate that into um, the average Joe who's listening to this, who's trying to get metabolically healthy. Sure. <laughs> so I realize uh, that may be a big leap, but. Yeah. And I'll take a, a little bit of a step back too. So our environments that we're in and the space environment actually causes a massive hit to our mitochondria. So environmental toxins, psychological stress, physical stress, high levels of sugar, high levels of inflammation, they all cause mitochondrial stress and mitochondrial dysregulation. In space, even if you optimize for everything, being in a zero gravity environment in space is very toxic for a number of different reasons. For one reason, there's no convection, right? So when I'm sitting here, Interesting. Faraday, if you know Faraday's candle, like Faraday's candle, if you look at the heat, it goes up and the heat goes up and it goes around like this, right? If Faraday's lectures, historic lectures, so think about your body, think a well, candle just, in for, space. For those who, who can't picture this, heat goes up and as it goes up, it cools down. But where there's no gravity, there's no up. Yes, that's right. So if we're put into a room in space that doesn't have any ventilation, we start breathing, but the heat and the CO2 stay around our, our head. So we just start building the CO2 bubble and we die. So, right, like a lot of wow. people don't know that. So this is like real important to understand that this happens at the macro level, but it also happens at the micro, at the level of the mitochondria. There's no gravity, so there's no convection. So convection happens in fluid too, right? So like there's thermoclines when you go in the water and things like that. So this lack of convection influences mitochondrial function, causes mitochondrial stress or active oxygen species. This is further exacerbated by hypercapnia, which is high levels of CO2, which is about 10 to 20 times higher. On the International Space Station, any space habitat is going to have like high levels of CO2. And it's further exacerbated by something called galactic cosmic radiation. So there are charged particles that are flying through us right now. But once we go out into deep space beyond the Van Allen belts, our bodies are being hammered by charged particles that are going right through us, right? This is called a GCR, galactic cosmic radiation. All these things create like massive mitochondrial dysregulation. And also it impacts our, our DNA too, right? It causes double-stranded nicks in the DNA and it causes mutations and we get more cancer and things like that. So what we want to do is really what programs NASA has, they have developing biological countermeasures against extreme environments and space radiation and all these things. So one of the countermeasures that they're looking into, and I was part of a group of scientists that were at the Cosmos Club, actually Dr. Richard Veach was there, and it was entitled the use of ketones for space travel, right? So it was like these top level scientists, I couldn't believe I was invited and it was at the Cosmos Club in DC. And we talked for a couple of days about the effects of ketones and how ketones can enhance DNA repair and that they can be an alternative energy source for fuel and things like that. So you can drink ketones and it has the energy density is very high. The ketogenic diet, for example, has an energy density that's like almost double of what like the standard American diet would be, right? Just because fat has nine calories per gram. So there was a, a lot of discussion about the logistics of using a higher fat ketogenic diet. And also the effects of these dietary interventions as countermeasures against all the negative effects of space, right? So this is a, it's a really interesting topic. And without going too much down the rabbit hole, I guess, and I went down a little bit so that ketogenic diets, they seem to shine in the context of mitigating extreme environmental stress. I want to throw something at you here real quick, because- yeah. We had a guest on the show. I can't remember when we had Hal Cranmer on, but this is an ex-Navy pilot who has opened a series of senior care facilities. 
and is feeding them, making sure that they eat a ketogenic diet. And literally yeah. in just the last week, he reported on one of his patients, I want to say late 70s, early 80s, who had been given a, a cognitive decline test. I may not have the name of the test right, but the yeah. gist of it was when she came into his facility, she was very clearly in a state of what I guess advanced Alzheimer's would look like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after being in his facility, eating a strictly ketogenic diet for a number of months, Phil, if you remember the number, jump in here, I don't. They continued to test her. And he reported last week that she scored 20 out of 28 out of 30, 28 out of 30 on this cognitive ability oh, test. Yeah. And was anyway. choosing to go home and live on her own after having been in a situation that most folks consider a death sentence and irreversible. Yeah. Based on the score, that test is called the mini mental status exam or MMSC. So yeah, that's actually Dr. Mary Newport, who you might want to have on the show here. I wrote the foreword to her, one of her last books. Her husband, Steve, had a similar effect simply using MCT oil and coconut oil and also a low carb diet. And then later she used the ketone esters that were supplied to her by Dr. Richard Veach at the NIH. And he improved significantly on the mini mental status exam and also what's called the clock test. So when you come into, when you get evaluated in an Alzheimer's facility, this was the Bird Alzheimer's Institute on the USF campus. Uh, they tell you to draw a clock and what time it is. And what he drew was nothing. You would never know it was a clock. And then after acutely, after he got into a state of ketosis, he was able to draw a clock and draw the hands of it and everything just, and it worked that fast. So Alzheimer's disease and age-related dementia, the hallmark characteristic is glucose hypometabolism. And if you do- um, Okay, because I'm not a, a scientist, physician, explain what glucose hypometabolism is. Hypo, hyper. Hypometabolism. Glucose so, hypometabolism, all right. Yeah. As we age, our brain has a decreased ability to use glucose as an energy source. And mm -hmm. that it's multifactorial as to why that occurs. There is a vascular component. So the brain blood flow progressively becomes impaired as we age. That's to be expected. And there's also some of the things like there's different enzymes that are rate limiting enzymes for glucose metabolism. That's good. One of them is pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, for example. We don't have to go into the enzymes. And there's also different transporters that transport the glucose across the cell membrane that allows the cells to use the glucose for fuel. And one of them is the GLUT3 transporter that's on the surface of the, the neuron. And the blood brain barrier is an area that separates like your peripheral blood from your brain blood, I guess is the best way to say it. there's a glucose transporter called the glucose transporter type one. And all these things are kind of decrease as we age. But the important thing to know is that as we age, our ability to use glucose as an energy source in the brain decreases. That is not the case with ketones. So if we can elevate ketones in the blood, then that can help to restore and preserve brain energy metabolism, even in the context of altered, meta altered metabolism in the brain. So we can basically jumpstart our brain metabolism. And I've come to like acknowledge that this is definitely the case for probably about maybe a third of the patients are hyper responsive to a metabolic intervention. Not all patients respond as remarkably well as Steve Newport and maybe this patient, but over the years I've communicated with hundreds of patients and Dr. Mary Newport has like thousands of patients in her book that she, and there's many, there's randomized controlled trials on this right now. There's RCTs on this idea and it's not a new idea. But yeah, so ketogenic diets are a way to put your body into therapeutic ketosis to give your brain more energy. But it's hard for, it's difficult for patients to follow a ketogenic diet. So we, we do research on ketogenic diets, but we also do research on ketone supplements. And we think that that's maybe a, a more appropriate metabolic intervention for that group of people. So, I mean, at this point, would you say that essentially most people are living in 
what's basically an extreme environment compared to sort of our evolutionary past. We're being bombarded with toxins of all sorts these days. And yeah. so in my mind, it's kind of, I would say that most of us are living in extreme environments and it would make a lot of sense that it would appear based on your research and, and the research of many others that ketosis is really our best way to mitigate that, to deal with that. Is that something that you would agree with? Well, not necessarily. I actually feel that low carb diets are the way to go. And a therapeutic ketogenic diet is a rather extreme diet. And it's also very high in fat. And the reality is that a large majority of people will not be able to sustain a clinical ketogenic diet as it's used in the world of neurology and epilepsy. But they can do, I would say, the large majority of people can follow a low carb diet defined as like under 100 grams of carbohydrates a day, no sugar, no starch, just from like fibrous vegetables and maybe one or two pieces of fruit or something like that. So that's definitely doable for like, I think 80% of the population. Some people just need to have sugar and bread and carbs. So I think 90% of the, the health problems that we have obesity, type 2 diabetes, and even preventing cancer and, and enhancing cognitive function can be restored just through simple carbohydrate restriction, but also increasing protein. And I think I followed a pretty strict ketogenic diet when I started researching it and started losing lean body mass. And I was doing DEXA scans. And over the course of maybe 15 years, I lost 18 pounds of lean body mass just following a strict ketogenic, but I was pretty heavy too, as you know, so now I'm still quite heavy, I guess, like 220, but I, but I was much heavier then. So I lost some fat, but I lost lean body mass too. But actually looking at a book, because it just came in the mail, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. So I got to plug her book. It just came in the mail today. So we just had a conversation. Her mentor was uh, Dr. Don Lehman. And Don Lehman was also the mentor of a friend of mine, Lane Norton, So, who's not particularly a ketogenic fan, but he does use it actually in some cases for clients. But the central hypothesis of her book and the research is that protein really should be central. So I think some people are following ketogenic diets and really just getting too much calories, right? And they're not, some, sometimes you just come across people, it's like, I follow the ketogenic diet. And I couldn't lose fat on it, but, but that's because they're eating too many calories, right? So <laughs> no matter what calories do matter, but calories are not everything. So, the, but calories may be like two thirds of the equation, right? So I'm kind of a centrist when it comes from like the calories, the calories in calories out model, and then the carb insulin model, I'm somewhere in the middle. So I think there's definitely truth to both sides. But one way to regulate your calories is just the hypersatiating effect of high protein diets. Most importantly, and the central theme behind Gabrielle's book and Don Lehman's research is that the protein helps you keep the lean body mass and the muscle is your metabolic currency that you need to build, like ideally younger in life. It's like your metabolic 401k, right? You want to, even as a teenager, the earlier you start, the better. Start lifting weights and building muscle. And that metabolic currency, you're depositing into it. Not only is it increasing your metabolic health, but muscle also builds bone. So the stronger your muscles, the higher bone mineral density you're going to have. And my DEXA, my bone, like it was like off the charts, my bone density. And I think that's because I lifted a lot when I was younger and I was kind of heavier and just into powerlifting and things like that. So I think that has a carryover effect later in life because it's easier to maintain that muscle. But an important thing is that you can start at any age. You could put an 80-year-old person into the weight room and they can start putting on muscle at a relatively fast pace and they could actually start increasing their bone density too. So low-carb diets with a central, like even Don Lehman, he's not like a low-carb guy, but he believes like we don't need any more than 100 grams of carbs a day. And like the dietary recommendations are for 300 grams of carbs a day. That makes absolutely no sense at all. So unless I'm sitting behind, I'm standing like you guys, like you are Phil, behind a desk most of the day. And I'm just not out there. If I was working all day or as an athlete with a very high output, maybe I would get two to 300 grams of carbs a day. And that would be helpful. But I feel great off 25 grams of carbs a day. 
on an average day, but I do fine. Usually I hit about 50 grams of carbs a day. And that's more than enough now to keep lean body mass. As long as I keep my protein at it, like 1.6 to 2 grams per kilogram, right? So that's quite a bit of protein. So we're talking almost about 200 grams of protein a day on higher days. So that's a lot. That's more yeah. than that's yeah. outside of the range of a ketogenic diet, but you, I stay very low carb on that. So you're also eating lean meats. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I'll have like six eggs in the morning, but I'll give like two or three yolks to my dogs. And then we had turkey last night and I have grass fed beef from either the local butcher where I get it. I'm still getting some days 200 grams of, per, of fat per day, but pretty much always about 150 grams of fat a day, which is like well more than twice the amount of, of That's fat. That's 1,350 calories of fat. Yeah. I did that so, in my head. Yeah. yeah. For, so, not bad for a music agent. No, that's great. Yes. Yes. So my early days, I was getting 300 grams of fat a day when I was doing a strict ketogenic diet, hitting the macronutrient ratios associated with the clinical ketogenic diet. But my carbs, like I said, a high carb day is hundred grams of carbs and that's 400 calories, right? That's yeah. like nothing. So yeah. So protein is central. That's going to be maintaining and building lean body mass. And actually you become more anabolic resistant as you age. So contrary to what most people think, as we age, we need to actually increase our protein requirements. Our protein requirements increase as we age due to anabolic resistance. That's good to so, hear. Yeah, very much so. As and, somebody and who loves eating as much meat as I can get my hands on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Get your protein. I, I think we all agree with that. So talk a little bit about the role for exogenous ketones and what situation yeah. that might be helpful in. I personally obviously have an interest in them with some of the science in helping cardiac metabolism and specifically yeah. people with congestive heart failure. But I'd like to hear kind of your perspective on exogenous ketones versus, like you said, what can be challenging to really get to those high levels of ketosis with just a dietary approach. Yeah. So if we elevate and sustain ketone levels in the blood, that has a plethora of beneficial effects. So not only is it providing a source of energy that the brain can use. And these are, I'll just say the things that we know. I won't go into the experimental science, like the epigenetic regulation, but if you elevate in a millimolar concentration to like one millimolar ketones, which is totally achievable on a low carb diet, that's say like under 50 grams of carbs a day, like no sugar, no starch. So you can achieve that. That's actually giving your brain about a 10% boost in available energy. So that can be significant in people, especially with dementia and even just like the everyday healthy person, right? So ketones too, elevating ketones in the blood, they're inversely proportional to glucose. So what's very interesting is that this seems to be somewhat independent of carbohydrate intake. And so this really surprised us in our research that when you consume exogenous ketones, they lower blood glucose proportionally. And we don't know why that happens. So it could be that the whole body, not just the brain. Yeah. The entire body, like your glucose will sharply go down if you consume exogenous ketones. And I was thinking, okay, well, the ketones are causing a release of insulin, right? And that is the case with a high dose of a ketone ester. It will trigger a release of insulin. But if you take an exogenous ketone electrolyte salt, so uh, I use keto start. Right. So if I consume that and get me up to 1.5, 1 to 1.5 millimolar, which is the therapeutic level, and then I measure my blood insulin at one hour after, it doesn't change, but the glucose still goes down. So what we think is happening, and I think this is really important, could be one of the more significant benefits of ketones, is that it helps to regulate blood glucose by Dr. Veach thought his hypothesis was that it was enhancing insulin sensitivity. So insulin, you are facilitating greater glucose disposal into tissues if you consume ketones. So insulin signaling is augmented and enhanced in a way, even though it doesn't increase insulin. I think that's part of the equation, but we're going to do liver metabolomics. And what I think is happening is that it's decreasing uh, ketogenesis. So the liver is the master or hepatic gluconeogenesis, right? 
Okay, so, English, I know what that yeah. means, but say okay, that in I'll English. I'll take a step back. So the glucose that you have in your blood right now is a direct result of the liver. The liver is releasing glucose in the blood through gluconeogenesis and what's called glycogenolysis. So the liver stores sugar in the form of glycogen. And then that's the sugar that like your brain is using now for energy and stuff. So the liver is like the master metabolic regulator. When ketones are elevated, similar to like metformin and other things, but we haven't worked out the mechanistic underpinnings of this, glucose goes down. And I think it is due in part to greater uptake of glucose in tissues and some tissues, not all, but also the liver is sensing that if ketones are available, the liver kind of has a mind of its own and senses that it does not need to put out as much glucose into circulation. So it dials back like a rheostat. It's not like on or off, right? It dials back the amount of glucose that it's putting into circulation. So in that case, it becomes very glycogen sparing and high fat, low carb athletes acknowledge and appreciate that ketogenic diets are very glycogen sparing for long duration events, right? So if you're burning fat for fuel and you're burning ketones and fat for fuel, you could spare your muscle glycogen and spare your liver glycogen too. And you can run longer because you're utilizing an energy source that we have on our body. That's like 20,000, 30,000 kilocalories of energy. It's like unlimited energy, right? You have better access to that just through suppressing the hormone insulin that ketogenic diets do. And you're using about two to three times more fat for energy. So that has a logistical advantage for like endurance athletes. So anyway, like if we introduce ketones into this, you have a lot of different benefits and I'm working on a paper now going through those benefits. It's like NAD, everybody's looking at NAD supplements. So NAD increases remarkably in tissues, in the brain, in the liver, and in the muscle when you're in a state of ketosis. So that happens. There's epigenetic effects, but it also decreases reactive oxygen species. So oxidative damage is less in the context of burning ketones as an energy source. Um, and it, it doesn't matter whether they're endogenous or exogenous? That's right. That's right. So beta hydroxybutyrate in circulation, when that's used as an energy source, whether it's from the liver through ketogenesis or through consuming a supplement, when that beta hydroxybutyrate ultimately gets converted to through a series of steps into ATP, our energy currency, there's a, a byproduct of metabolism called superoxide anion. And this is what we measured in the lab. It's like years ago. This is actually what cued me in on like how ketones could be beneficial because we had a laser scanning confocal inside of a thing and we we're giving it, we we're feeding the cells different. If I gave it a bolus of glucose, I would see free radicals would go up high. If I gave the same amount of energy as ketones, the energy would be maintained, but the reactive oxygen species would go down. So that's because the ketones can oxidize Q and you don't make this, the initial reactive oxygen species or what we call free radicals is super oxide anion. And then it gets converted to hydrogen peroxide. Then in the context of high iron that can generate a hydroxyl radical. And then that causes all sorts of bad things to happen. So ketones more or less, it doesn't eliminate that, but it knocks it down like 80%. So if our bodies are utilizing ketones as an energy source, we have sustained suppression of oxidative stress. And this is kind of a little bit of a debatable subject that could contribute to the aging process. So there's theories out there about the theories of aging, reactive oxygen species are part of it. But another really important effect of being in ketosis is that it changes, and this is probably the most important thing that I study, is that it changes the neurotransmitters in your brain, right? So you could put someone on a vegan diet, you could put them on a carnivore diet, standard American optimal diet, and then a ketogenic diet. But the only thing that's going to control seizures is really maybe a carnivore diet, like a keto carnivore. But really the only thing that will dramatically control seizures that have been shown in six randomized controlled trials is a clinical ketogenic diet. So in that way, the ketogenic diet is kind of magical in the way that it changes your energy systems 
and it profoundly changes the neuropharmacology of your brain. And the thing that we look at is adenosine receptor signaling. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but GABA. GABA goes way up about two times higher. So there's glutamate, and that's an excitatory neurotransmitter. And then there's GABA, which is like a calming, chill out neurotransmitter that helps you sleep, right? So the ratio of glutamate to GABA uh, will decrease or just GABA increases relative to glutamate. And there's two enzymes, glutamic acid decarboxylase, GAD65 and 67, and these enzymes are increased. So what it does is it takes an excitatory amino acid uh, neurotransmitter, glutamate, and converts it to GABA. So glutamate, if we have high levels of glutamate, we are we're anxious, we're hyperexcitable, actually associated with neurological diseases. Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, pretty much every age-related neurodegenerative disease is pathophysiologically linked to elevated glutamate, right? What the ketogenic diet does pretty remarkably, and also exogenous ketones do this too, it converts more of the glutamate to GABA. So we have shown this experimentally in different model systems, but I think there's human data that kind of replicate this too. So that's another really important thing. If people have anxiety, if people have ADHD, there's a lot of applications to balancing your neurotransmitter systems. And really that's what the ketogenic diet does. It restores brain energy balance, but also restores neurotransmitter balance in the brain. And people- Okay, are we are 50 minutes into this and I am absolutely fascinated. I want lots, 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 lots more but we've still got to talk about this conference. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the most important thing, yeah. And I also want to mention that, well, in passing, so people think that the ketogenic diet, you can't eat any kind of like sugar or any kind of sweets or things like that. There are products being developed now, and I don't want to like overly plug it, but I'm actually looking at something called Allulose, and it's in a product called RX Sugar here. And it was just on a scientific advisory board meeting where I've been testing it with my CGM. And allulose is very interesting is that if you switch out the glucose or fructose with allulose and you consume a candy bar with allulose, your glucose goes down. Holy has, smokes. Yeah. it's <laughs> Don't take this out of context, folks. No. When I first tried allulose, <laughs> I was like, I'm never going to do that again. I have massive like bloating. I was like in a faculty meeting. I was like, I got to get out of here. So I took too much of it. I took, the, but, but there's a threshold level for me Every, on a ketogenic diet. You're very sensitive to it because you don't have the carbohydrate transporters, but I've felt that I can build a tolerance to it, but there are different, I'll say rare sugars that are being developed that could lead to a whole line of products. For example, if you just like take out sugar and put in allulose into even like processed food products that could have a huge impact on our metabolic health just by regulating glucose and insulin, right? So I'm super interested in D-allulose and all the potential beneficial effects. So our lab is kind of angling to look at D-allulose as a glycolytic inhibitor. It's a GLP-1 agonist. It's an exercise medic. It activates AMP kinase. I could go down the rabbit hole. I mean, there's a lot of really exciting effects of some of these sugars and and then non-nutritive sweeteners are kind of getting a bad rap. And I was like, I didn't think much of it, but the more I think about it, I think it's really good to gravitate towards something like D-allulose, which actually has beneficial effects, even on the microbiome, like lactobacillus and acromensia. These things are healthy for a microbiome. They increase with D-allulose. So that's another direction. I just want to add that the D-allulose would be part of the ketogenic diet. So we would formulate a ketogenic diet with optimal protein, but make it palatable, not hyper palatable, because if you take the ketogenic diet, and make it hyper palatable, I think you're in the same bad situation. You're just going to eat too much of it, right? Yeah. I think there's a lot of nuance here, but yeah, let's talk about the metabolic health summit because <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. So our whole, um, our lab, our mission, our whole mission is really to do basic science research and to move the science into clinical application. And it started as meetings at USF campus, but has evolved. And really it's the efforts of my co-host, Dr. Angela Poff and Dr. Uh, Victoria Field, who do the major lifting of this event. And I would encourage people to go to metabolichealthsummit.com. 
and you'll find all the information there on the amazing speakers we've had in the past. And we try to do basic science, clinical science, but we also make it an opportunity for people to network. And we include sponsors that are helping us advance the science and the application of diet therapies. So, and that could be someone who's developing an app that could help you with a low carb diet, continuous glucose monitoring, Genova Diagnostics have been a great sponsor. I use them for a lot of my blood work and testing that I do. Food companies. So th this event will be January 25th to 28th at Clearwater, Florida on the coast. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be as Philip knows. <laughs> in January to be in Florida. So usually we're about 75, 80 degrees, beautiful sunshine, very, the whitest sands of any beaches around. And I Florida, love that idea. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, I just got it's, back from Mexico and I thought oh, yeah. I would have a fantastic beach and I was deeply disappointed anyway. Oh, carry. really? Huh. Yeah, Mexico can be hit or miss depending on where you go. But huh. I think I was in Tulum, Mexico. I drove down from Cancun. That was a beautiful beach. But I don't think it rivals Clearwater, Florida, because there's just so much to do. Right? I mean, you got the aquarium, you got the pier, which has like vendors out there and like little artsy craftsy things. There's entertainment like going on all around you, like street entertainment. It's a very dynamic, energetic place. And we are very excited to be hosting the conference here to bring it back to Florida because it's been in California. It was in Santa Barbara in 2022 and encourage people to also submit a scientific abstract. So you can go to the website, metabolichealthsummit.com and submit a scientific abstract, whether it's basic science, clinical research, an N of one study, whatever you have, submit it. And that goes into the poster session. And that's a great opportunity. And some of my medical students and graduate students are going to be, you know, presenting abstracts there. So you'll see, we'll probably have about 20 posters there. So you'll see the latest scientific research, clinical research out before anybody else does. And you'll get to talk to the investigators and it's a great, it's right before the VIP gala dinner, I believe. So yeah, Victoria and Angela, I, I'm like the third co-host who just like tags along for the ride, but <laughs> they do a lot of the lift, lifting and I try to help with the education outreach and promoting it also with the metabolic link podcast. I'd like to direct people to that. And what we do in that podcast is highlight many of the speakers that we have in the past and that we uh, plan to have speaking at this event. Yeah. And, uh, I was able to attend in uh, Santa Barbara two years ago and certainly planning on being there in Clearwater and, uh, really just a great meeting, the mix of the science that's at the forefront and like you said, the networking opportunities, just having the opportunity to really see the leaders in the space, interact with them, really a great opportunity for anyone that's interested in metabolic health from either research, clinical, or just personal standpoints. Yeah, it's great to see all these low-carb conferences coming up. And Doug Reynolds does a great job with Low Carb USA. And uh, you know, I attend and, and present at that too. And I think it's great that everybody can kind of work together and co-promote each other's event uh, because I like to go to them all as many as I can outside of my teaching and research obligations. And I think it's just a great way to learn and to network. And it, the most important thing in advancing this whole idea of metabolic health is just you have to get out there to an in-person conference. I, I would like to add, though, that a lot of people just can't afford the time or get off work or they have families. They can't attend the event in person. We have an amazing uh, virtual component to our conference that would allow, for example, people to see, to have access to all the presentations, to actually see the, uh, the poster sessions and to interact with the speakers uh, on the virtual component. So if you can't attend in person, you could do the virtual component and uh, that would give you access to everything. And actually, I think there's yeah. some additional perks to that too. Yep. And we had Doug on a, a week or two ago and Florida will be the uh, epicenter of metabolic health in January. The conferences, I think, are uh, 10 days apart or so. So you can come make yeah. a extended vacation in the nice weather and check out both conferences uh, even better. So absolutely. Uh, yeah, I was just emailing Doug and I want to have him over here at the house just at our uh, farm. So just to hang out and do some activities and stuff around the farm. So looking forward to his event and looking forward to 
just super excited about hosting Metabolic Health Summit in Florida, right? And bringing it back to Florida. It started here 10 years ago. So we're just very excited to bring it back here. Well, very good. D'Agostino, how is the best way for folks to connect with you? What do you prefer? Yeah, actually, I have an informational website that I started like 15 plus years ago called ketonutrition.org. And that website is an informational website. We have a blog. I think we just posted a blog today on sex differences and metabolism. And uh, I'm working on another blog on a supplement HMB and Alzheimer's disease. So there's that. You can sign up for the newsletter. And in the newsletter, we will promote this uh, podcast. So all the podcasts that I do, I put in the newsletter, deals that we have, special deals on different supplements, discounts on conferences and things like that. We put Doug's conference in here. Of course, we put Metabolic Health Summit uh, discount opportunities into the newsletter. So sign up for the newsletter. That's ketonutrition.org. Check out the website. I have a lot of resources. I get a lot of people ask me about doctors and consultants that they're navigating different health challenges. So I have a range of different doctors and consultants and stuff listed on there and just a bunch of links and products and stuff too. Fantastic. All right. We will make sure that shows up in the show notes. Ketonutrition.org. Phil, once again, you're blowing my mind. I love it. <laughs> Anything to add before we call it a day? No, just thank you, Dom, for all the uh, great work you're doing, uh, both on the research front and getting the message out, uh, hosting the conference, I think is a, a huge help in that regard. And I'm really excited to talk with you again and to certainly see you in January, if not before. Well, it's great fun to host a conference and it's great fun to be on this podcast. I appreciate you guys offering me this platform to talk about my research and to uh, talk about the conference a little too. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you guys soon. Loved it. All right. Well, for Dom D'Agostino and Dr. Philip Ovedia, this has been the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast, and we will talk to you next time. Chances are you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you didn't need to change your life and get healthier. So take action right now. Book a call with Dr. Ovedia's team. One small step in the right direction is all it takes to get started. Contact us at ifixhearts.com slash talk. That's ifixhearts.com slash talk.